Well, thank you all very much for coming out. Um, I realize in today's crazy world, I should have called the title The Shape of Technical Revolutions or Data Revolutions so I don't end up on somebody's list. Uh, so I want to talk to you about how technical revolutions take place, what your role can be, why some are successful and some are not. Um, I work as a prin uh, principal uh, technologist for MAPR. I'm a committer on the Apache Mahood and Apache Drill projects, a huge enthusiast for Apache Flink, and I write some short books for O'Reilly Media I would be thrilled if you follow me on Twitter. All right, so what makes an innovative idea have real impact, whether it's from ancient history, modern things? Why do some of them really find uh, uh, traction and change the way people think and the way that they work? So let's start with an old story. This is from the 19th century. Gregor Mendel is basically the father of modern genetics. Uh, my original background is biochemist and a molecular geneticist, so I'll give you a story from my world. Okay, so this is back in the mid-19th century. There was a question of how inheritance happens. People didn't know about genes, they didn't know about any of this. And so the question was whether, big idea, is inheritance blended? Do you, does the offspring have a combination of traits from both parents, but where those traits blend together. And he wanted to test this, being a good scientist. He realized he should do a test. He did this with pea plants, about 20,000 pea plants, seven traits. I'll give you the example of looking at tall and short plants. So the question is, if you look breathe those together, look at the different generations, if it's blended inheritance, if you have a tall uh, parent and a short parent, the offspring becomes an intermediate size. This is not what he observed with his many, many trials, and instead he saw a ratio of three to one of the traits in the offspring, and he did this with seven different traits. So, big idea, a lot of experimental data. The data did not support blended inheritance. It supported discontinuous inheritance. He went on and thought about that, came up with terms like dominant recessive, and began to think about what this process could be. Again, being a very good scientist, he knew it wasn't just enough to make the discovery. He had to communicate this. And he did this in two talks to a group of uh, fellow scientists in 1865, and he followed this up by a publication in 1866, uh, that was translated called Experiments on Plant Hybridization. So this is a huge discovery with very strong data to support it. This is a very big deal. And as you can imagine, what was the impact from that? What was the effect? Well, initially it was nothing. And the reason it was nothing is that those 40 scientists, for example, who were present at those presentations, they got stuck on the details or maybe because of the way he named his paper. But they thought this was interesting. It was a nice little set of experiments about plant hybridization. And they failed to grasp the enormous idea that he had basically provided data to explain how the fundamentals of genetics works. And it was only 30 years later that several different scientists beginning to have those same ideas and to do experiments then rediscovered his paper. Uh, a couple of them were very good about also acknowledging his earlier work. One was William Bateson, who worked in the Botanic Garden at Cambridge University in the UK. Another Another was Kyle Korens, I think from Munich, certainly a German scientist, and they not only popularized these ideas, but they gave Mendel the credit that he observed, uh, deserved for this. And the end result of that is this, this idea really lit up for people. Enormous amount of research followed, and that brings us up to modern day molecular genetics, genetics. It's a huge thing. So the lesson that I want you to take away from this is that to have a really innovative idea and have it have a real effect on people, you not only need that creativity, the people who develop, say, a new technology, a new software, but the users have to have vision. They have to look beyond just the details and think about what they can really do with these innovative ideas or technology. Now, big data itself has been a revolution, and within that revolution, there's a new revolution, which is to look at streaming data. So just beginning to work at huge scale, people had to realize it isn't just that big is big, but you can ask questions once you get to a certain scale of data that you could never have addressed before. And now people are beginning to see that by working with streaming data, data from continuous events, again, it changes the way they can think and the kinds of applications they can build, the way they can do business. So let's take a look at how that works. There are a lot of different sources of streaming data. 
partly because life doesn't happen in batches, it tends to happen as continuous events. Even things as simple as a user coming to a website, clicks on the website, can be handled as a stream of events. But one of the obvious places that we look for uh, streaming data is in the Internet of Things, IoT. You see it across you know, so many different industries. A lot of change is happening, even in the way people manufacture so-called smart parts, where they're putting sensors on everything. They're reporting back, not only to the user, but to the manufacturer. Now, the reason a lot of people first start looking to the possibility of working with streaming data is because they need some kind of real-time time insight, some kind of very low latency application that they're building. There are a number of good tools. Ooh, my focus doesn't seem so great on this, but can you see? Okay, I hadn't looked at the slides. All right. There are a number of good tools for doing real-time processing or very low latency processing. I'm, as I said, a big enthusiast for the Apache Flink project. Anybody in here actually use Flink, tried out Flink? Yeah, okay. Um, but there are a lot of different uh, good choices for doing the processing. But what I want to focus on for a minute is not the processing, but go upstream a little bit, and it's what choices you make in terms of the stream transport. And it turns out, if you have stream transport technology and if the design of your system has certain capabilities, it suddenly opens you up to what I'm calling a stream-first architecture. It has huge advantages and, surprisingly, advantages way past that kind of midline through my figure here of that real-time or low-latency application. So I picked an example here, say, from the medical industry, but you could put whatever you want here. Financial services is the same principle. Say somebody comes in, they have data coming in from instrumentation, they put that into a stream transport. I'm using a horizontal cylinder to indicate that's the message transport. They've built a real-time application, maybe updating a real-time dashboard, that's fine. But if they also have the right kind of capability in that message transport technology. In addition, they have other classes of use cases. Down at the bottom, I don't know if you can read it, I put insurance audit. What I'm saying is in this setting, if you can actually have durable messages and indeed long-term, very long-term messages, it means you also have a long-term auditable history, and that can be useful in a lot of different industries. My set of use cases up at the top assume that there are situations where instead of looking at the event-by-event -event history, you want to look at the current status of things, maybe data that you would realize into a database or a searchable document. In this case, my medical example, I said that might be electronic medical records, and that's a different reason uh, to use this. But they're all coming off of that center at the heart of this stream-first architecture is the message stream. So when people begin to broaden their thinking, they realize that streaming data is good for things beyond that kind of real-time situation that may be their first reason for coming to it, and the possibilities become huge. Now, when I say the right kind of stream transport, Certain capabilities really matter, and I think the ones, because it's a very short talk I want to focus on quickly, are really the most important thing that uh, Apache Coffee, in a way, really solved this problem. And I do work with MapR. MapR has a stream transport called MapR Streams that is literally an extension of the file system. It's all one technology, their database, their stream transport, and their distributed files. But Apache Kafka, map our streams, which uses Kafka API, they share certain characteristics. And the one that I want you to think about for a moment is that they really solve the problem of, at very large scale, being able to have high performance with durable messages, with persistence. You no longer have to trade that off. And that turns out to have a tremendous effect on this kind of architecture. By instead of broadcasting the message to the consumers, the message has to be there right away so you can do low latency work, but the consumer doesn't have to be online when the message arrives. It can be added later, you can add a new consumer. Suddenly you've decoupled the multiple consumers, multiple producers, and multiple consumers in this system. And what that gives you is a tremendous flexibility, even the ability to do a microservices style approach. So you need that lightweight connector between different services instead of a REST API. In this case, you can actually look at that as being a message stream, and it gives you some huge advantages in how you work. So 
take this simple example of a situation where you have a fraud detector, what I might call card velocity, somebody does a transaction, you basically have a machine learning model that's saying the location, the timing of that transaction. If I bought a coffee at lunch here, and 15 minutes later I bought a beautiful silk blouse in Singapore, something's not right, okay. So you need a history of previous card transactions, and you're making that comparison. So you have this machine learning fraud detector model, you have a database with card history, and then as you scale up, you have many models addressing that same database because you need to go back to the same data, but what happens is that begins to heat up. You end up with too much traffic, it's hard to keep performance, and also you've already refined that data down for this particular project, for this particular application. If you change this and do something as simple as bring in that data stream. Now you add a data stream for card activity, you still have the updater process, so you're still updating your database, you're doing this, this project in exactly the same way. But what happens now, remember that independence of consumers, now you can have other groups using that same data. And indeed, you, your project, can be an other group because you're gonna be rolling out new models that you wanna test. You're testing them against the same data, you're not interfering with what's happening in production, and this even lets you do a hot handoff very easily. So suddenly you have a very powerful architecture just by adding that data stream. So the lesson here is to think of the data stream, which even can be queried directly, but that data stream as being kind of the universal truth. It's at the heart of what you and other groups in your organization are doing. The database becomes a very powerful and very useful, but specialized, Thing that's set up for each different project. So it's optimized for what individual projects are doing, but you're retaining all of that detail in the data by keeping it in a data stream that everybody's going back to so they don't interfere with each other and you haven't thrown away data that later you'll find out was the key data that you needed for some reason. Additionally, people are, especially with machine learning models, looking for ways that they can act locally but learn globally and essentially work with what I'm calling a global data fabric. And what I mean by that is the ability to work with the same data from different locations, do that on-premises, do it in cloud, from cloud to cloud, it really doesn't matter. That you, how many people in here think of themselves more on the side of developers, is IT and admin? How many are developers, data scientists? Okay, that's what I was guessing. <laughs> so, it, this, ability to work with a global data fabric. As a developer, you want to use the data that you want. You want to be able to have access to all data if you need it for a particular project. Some data you probably shouldn't have access to, so whoever's controlling that should be able to keep the data in one country if it's not supposed to move, not give you access to things you don't want access to. But you don't want to have to have a committee meeting every time you write a new application or build a new model. And so what we're really looking for are systems that give you the ability to access whatever you want, the people who deal with IT and system administration to be able to do that conveniently and not have to be asking you constantly, what are you building? You know, it's a real multi-tenant system where you can do what you need, they move data where it needs to be, control access, you have access to what you need. And by separating those concerns, both groups can do their work much more effectively. This really makes a huge difference. Now, I've put up this example because I want to talk to you about a real-world example. I do consulting for MapR. MapR is an unusual technology, as I said, in that their distributed data platform is a single technology that has distributed files, a real file system, message transport, to database, it's all built together. And in fact, this is looking at a home directory. You see files, tables, and streams in that same directory. This uh, cluster and volume mount point that you see down in the corner is basically a key to how they basically have a global namespace. And so these capabilities combined with the ability to do uh, direct multi-master omnidirectional table replication, multi-master omnidirectional stream replication uh, really makes you able to work in this sort of global data fabric style and with the separation of concerns. MapR Streams works similar to Kafka in many ways. You have topics. A couple of differences, though, in this case is that you can have hundreds of thousands or millions of topics easily running on the same machine. 
you collect those together into a first-class object called a stream, and that's where policies such as time to live and replication are set. And so it really makes a difference in this sense of if you, the developer, are, are, are building this application as a consumer from this stream, it doesn't matter if that data source is in the same geographical location or with stream replication if it's halfway around the world. That's not a concern for you, and so you really separate that and you get a huge advantage. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to race through this, but a map our customer that does streaming video, they need to be able to deal with metrics monitoring. They're, they have huge amounts of data and need very low latency. And their particular situation here, they were already using MapR, but they switched to now using MapR streams in the stream first sort of style, taking advantage of stream replication. And in just a couple of months, their ability to deal with data from the data center, move it into global headquarters, and be able to do that from multiple data centers made such a difference, just that one change in how they're working, that they came back to us and said they basically felt like they had a year of development time in the bank. So think for a minute, if you had a free year, <laughs> you're still on target and could work on anything you wanted extra for a year, you know, where would that leave you? That's a wonderful feeling. And so that separation of concerns, what they found is by having the platform deal with the logistics, it freed them up uh, to deal with what they wanted to build and not have to do all of that at the application level. So it doesn't really matter the individual industry. You can see this would have applications in a lot of different projects. I just remind you, I've talked at a previous buzzwords about the importance of communicating between teams and this is particularly important. You guys have very technical knowledge. If you want to avoid the problem of the 40 scientists who didn't appreciate what Mendel did, uh, it's really a challenge for you. But you have to talk to people with different domain knowledge outside your organization, within your organization. And also one way to make that work really well is to think about your expertise as data scientists, as, as machine learning experts, whatever it is that you do. But in addition, you're working on specific projects. And so don't think of yourself as I'm loaning time or having to talk to somebody from another department, but also see those cross-departmental cuts as an individual project. And people really, you know, pull together that way. They work better together, and yet they keep their own, you know, their own ability and their own expertise. They have to change their communication. But I think that's easier to do when you really do see that you have common goals. Last thought here, I probably have mentioned this in previous years, but I love this project. Again, I know about it because I write about the things that map our customers do. Um, the, I can't pronounce this correctly, but uh, what I call the Aadhaar project in India is a universal ID project for India. All 1.2 billion people will have a unique identification. The project's almost complete in terms of signing people up. The authentication part of this project, they have a unique multi-digit uh, number they use biometric data, um, but all of this has to be able to be authenticated in about as long as it would take you to swipe a credit card, but this has to be able to be available, entirely available, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, from anywhere in India. So it's a, it's a huge SLA from the social side of it. They had tried to do this with HBase. They simply couldn't meet that kind of reliability without more and more and more clusters. In November 2014, they moved the authentication part of the project over to the MapR NoSQL database, MapRDB, and they have had zero downtime since then. Why I love this project, though, why I wanted to tell you about it, is when I first first heard about it was a talk about MapRDB, but I was thinking, okay, so they, they made a universal ID, like, that's nice, why did they do it? Which shows my ignorance. And so as I found out more about it, this is a, a, a project that changes lives at a societal level. Now some of the poorest people in India are able to have businesses, they can open a bank account, they can get a loan. It's tremendously changed how much money gets siphoned off from government, government welfare to fraud because people show up and say, you know, give me money to support these 100 workers in my factory, and they say, okay, show us the 100 workers, you know, what's their ID? So this has had a massive effect. And the thing that's cool, they did need a good technology, that was why I started looking at it, but the fundamental innovation there and the real impact is the people who had the vision to build it, but also to see how to use it, to see what it could do, people who had the vision to see what that tremendous idea could bring about. Now, 
It's been an honor to be here in Berlin this last spring. I was very happy to see some beautiful pictures of the people who came out for a science march. And so I'm basically uh, speaking here in a place where I know that people understand data, and I know they're very creative people, and when you put those two things together, amazing things can happen. So I leave you with this question. What is it that you will build? What's the impact going to be? So I just want to remind you, there is a short data report that deals with this idea of global data fabric. All these are available. MapR, well, O'Reilly sells the little books and give away the data report, but MapR makes them all available on the website. If you want to go there, the links are in the slides, which will be put up or talk to me after, and I'll email you the links. There's a short book that I wrote with uh, Ted Dunning, who spoke earlier, and who right now is doing a totally cool demonstration on IoT data, with, to, together with Tug in the Palais Atelier at the top of the, where the roof garden is. And I'm going to be running over there after, because it's going to be fun. They have little connected cars and devices, and it's really cool. Anyway, a lot of these ideas are in this streaming architecture book. And with Costa Sumas, I wrote a, a short introduction to Apache Flink. The data artisans guys have a few copies. I'll have some copies over at the IoT demonstration, and they're all available online. Please continue to help support women in technology. It's something that's important, not just for, for women, but for society. And this is one woman in high tech in the middle of a jet engine. And I thank you all very much for having me here.